All right, in the notes for this morning, there's uh, two extra pages there. Don't be alarmed. You won't be here till 3 o'clock. There's no way we can get through all of those scriptures. But uh, there are some studies in particular that I overload the scriptures because hopefully I'm, I'm hoping that you'll take these home and study them topically. And so, no, we, don't, we won't make it through all the way, but the first two pages in themselves are review from last week, last Sunday morning, so we'll go quickly through that, get us back up to speed, and then talk about what we want to talk about this morning. But we've been talking about what is next in God's agenda for this world and for the church. And it's very important that this is something that becomes very real to us, that we anticipate, that we look for eagerly, that we love. What is God's agenda? What's, what's happening next in the church? It's the rapture. And we said, shared last week, that the word rapture actually does not appear in the Bible anywhere. It is a word that, the, that Christians have adopted through the generations to describe this event. The, defini the dictionary definition is the state of being transported from one sphere of existence to another, and it's always with great joy, ecstatic joy. Boy, what a day that will be. You know, I, there's no way that we can imagine the joy, the exhilaration, the rejoicing that will be in our heart on that day when we pass from this life into the next and we find the fulfillment of our faith and just that climax of realizing it was worth it all. It was real. It was true. Not that we have any doubts, but boy, the experience of it is going to be so wonderful, isn't it? To finally obtain what we've been looking for and striving for. We said that the, this event that is talked about is referred to in many different ways. It's referred to in the Bible as his appearing. It's referred to as the blessed hope. It's referred to probably most often as his coming. And then it's also referred to as our gathering together unto him. So those are the words as you're reading the scriptures that you want to look for as it relates to this event that we call the rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is uh, probably the best, most detailed description of it in the New Testament. Verse 15, For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left unto the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. And Paul was saying this to address a concern, because remember when, when Jesus uh, ascended up into heaven, he said, I'm going to come back in like manner, and... Uh, but saints started to die because his uh, return was not yet. And people started to wonder, well, what about Uncle Joe? You know, he's died and he's missed the rapture. What's going to happen to him? So he's, he's comforting their heart to know, hey, the dead in Christ will be taken care of. Don't worry. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with a great shout, a supernatural shout a shout like human ears have never, ever heard before. And I want to tell you something. Your heart and my heart are going to just leap out of our chest when we hear that great shout. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command. We will both be awestruck, amazed, and at the same time, we will instantly recognize that's the voice of my Savior. I know that voice. And it will be an audible command for us to rise and meet him in the air. He says the dead in Christ will rise first. Graves are going to be opened. Be interesting to see how CNN explains that one. Graves will be opened. The dead in Christ will rise. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds. What a great reunion in the clouds with Jesus. Can you just imagine the veil being ripped away, the darkness, you know, the shadows that we peer through now being gone and we see him Finally, face to face, and lo and behold, we're suspended here in air. How, how neat is that, huh? And we are with him, and then he takes us home, so we will always be with the Lord. I just, uh, just, I mean, we could sit here for the next hour and just try to imagine what that's going to be like. Won't that be a glorious time? He says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another that it is worth it. The suffering, the sacrifices, the laying down of your life, the surrender, obeying when it's hard to obey, it's worth it. 
that moment that we all look forward to makes it all worth it. In fact, Paul says that this moment will be so much greater than anything we have ever known that it far outweighs any suffering that we've been through. What we think is suffering can't even be called suffering in comparison to this great glory of meeting him in the air one day. Encourage one another with these words. Don't give up. There's a day coming when it's all worth it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is another great uh, detailed description of what happens. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, transformed in a moment in the twinkle of an eye. Wow. This body, this decaying flesh, this aging flesh, this natural body that is subject to sickness and ailments, subject to temptation and sin, in just the twinkle of an eye, it will be changed into a glorified body like Jesus's. Can you imagine that? Paul, I know you're looking forward to that, right? The trials in your body you've been going through. Just, can you imagine that? Instantly the sickness is gone. Instantly the pain is gone. Instantly the temptation to sin is gone. Instantly the guilt and condemnation from the past is gone. Instantly we will be changed and made like him. And the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed also. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. And that happens in just a second. The twinkle of an eye will be with him in the air and then with him forever and ever. That's the rapture. Jesus commands us to be ready. Matthew 24, verse 36. And I'm reviewing this again because this needs to be reviewed. If, if I could somehow take a hammer and chisel and chisel this into your brain, I, could, I would. But I can't, and I shouldn't, so I won't. But verse 36 says, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. And so when you go on YouTube and you see all these videos of predictions that you know, the end of the world will be on this day, and Jesus is coming back on that day, and they give specific dates. You know, automatically, verse 36 says, not so, only the Father knows that date, when these things will begin to take place. For as were the days of Noah, so will the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered into the ark. Just like in the days of Noah, what this is saying is, in our day, most people think it's business as usual. Jesus coming back. Not Jesus isn't coming back. God's going to do what? Nah, God's not. Look, this world is continuing on just fine. Yeah, we've got our economic problems. We've got our problems with terrorism. We've got our problems with this and that. But, you know, in the end, it'll, it'll all equal out in the end. It'll be okay. Jesus isn't coming back. And the routine of this life lulls people to sleep so that they don't expect him to come back. Do you realize how many generations and hundreds of years the Jews believed Jesus was coming at the first time? And how many Jews during the course of all those hundreds of years, through all the major and the minor prophets, and how many times did they think, oh, Jesus, is, is Jesus really coming? You know how many generations have passed and he hasn't come yet? Is he really coming? And guess what happened? He really came. And so in our day, as well, we can be lulled to sleep and think, it's not going to happen, it hasn't happened yet, dear Lord, how long is it going to take? And, and we can just start to be consumed in the routine and the lifestyle of this earth life. But he's warning us here, it's coming. So you can never let your guard down. You can never expect anything else but his coming. Because just like the flood came, so will Jesus come. Don't be distracted by eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriages. Don't be distracted by business as usual. Jesus will pierce the sky one day. It could be today. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus gives us this warning. Matthew 24 and Matthew 25 are very special because this is at the end of his ministry, right before the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was betrayed and crucified. These are Jesus' last words to the church. 
Jesus' last words to his disciples. And this is what he told them. This is, this is the last thing he wanted in their mind and in their heart. I'm coming back. Don't be lulled to sleep. Don't let the routine blind your eyes. Always be expecting my return. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, one left. Therefore, do what? Stay awake. Be alert. This has got to be always in your mind. This is what you're preparing for. And sadly, a lot of the church has gotten so far off track. And they've interpreted the scriptures in light of some vision that, you know, we're going to take over our communities, we're going to take over the nation, we're going to bring God's kingdom here on earth, we're going to make our life better, easier for us by uh, implementing all of these Christian principles and you know, the scriptures were not written for the earth life. The scriptures were written to prepare us for our heavenly life. And our heart and our mind is to be there. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. So we're not here to make things better on us in the here and now. We're here to prepare for that day when Jesus comes back that we might be received by him. You only get one chance at it. We got to get it right. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. What do you do when something's going to happen, but you don't know when it's going to happen? You've got to always be ready. And you've got to be expecting. This could happen this hour. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his house to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing. And we're going to look at this morning, what does the master want to find us doing when he gets back? Didn't you like it in the days of school when the teacher told you what the test was going to be on? Gave you confidence, you know, you could study exactly what you needed to know. And we're in Matthew 25, the next chapter. Jesus lets you know what's going to be on the test. And he wants to know, is he going to find you doing those things in Matthew 25 that he stipulates? He says in verse 47, truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. Hopefully next week, I, I thought this Sunday, but it didn't turn out that way. Maybe next Sunday we'll talk about the Bema judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, and the, the judgment of rewards that all of us will stand before Watch what happens, he says, but if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed, you know, I've got time. No, you don't have time. It's not going to happen anytime soon. Maybe it won't even happen at all. And, and he begins to beat his fellow servants, and he begins to live selfishly, and he begins to consume life on himself, and he eats and drinks with the drunk. Then the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect, and in an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces. That's kind of a graphic image, isn't it? We'll cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. You know, last Sunday I was sharing, we're in the dispensation of grace, and in the dispensation of grace where there's mercy and grace and forgiveness, and, you know, we, we tend to forget that God is a God of judgment, and he's coming back to rule the nations with a rod of iron, and one day he is coming back, to pour out his fury and the vengeance of God upon this earth and against all ungodliness. We better get going while the getting is good. And right now, the getting is good. We've got to get right with God now. We have to start preparing now because there is a day when he will come back and cut into pieces the hypocrites. And in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And you know what? I wouldn't love you if I didn't tell you so. We've got to be ready. What does it mean to be ready? What is required? Who does the work? You know, it doesn't take long. It doesn't take much reading in the scriptures to figure out that God requires holiness. And this is something that, again, tragically, so much of the church has erred from. We, we've developed a gospel that says we can live any way we want and God will always understand, always forgive, always extend mercy. He won't really follow through with his justice. I want to tell you something. The Bible says you must be holy even as he is holy. 
You're a servant to sin or you're a servant to righteousness. There's nothing in between. You only have two choices. There is no such thing as living life your way. So if you're not a servant to sin, the only way out is to be a servant to God. We don't fully appreciate the destruction that sin has in our life. I, I don't think we do. God grant it that we get more and more understanding into the effects of sin and the effects of righteousness. But I want to tell you something. The cause of all of your problems is your sinfulness. Your depression is because of your sinfulness. Your depression is not because of this person or that person or these events that happened in my life. Your insecurities, your fear, your anxieties, it all points back to your sinfulness. Why wouldn't you want to be holy? Holiness is what sets you free. You'll never be freer than when you are a slave to Jesus Christ because there's only two options. So you can either serve sin and serve the devil and be miserable and be on a path of self-destruction, or you can be wholly separated unto God and serve God and be free and have all the joy and the peace you can imagine. It's stupid not to choose holiness. But yet when you hear the word holiness, sometimes our reaction is like that little child who's told to go clean up his room, you know, and you roll your eye, do I have to? You get to. Holiness is not only a privilege, holiness is a pleasure. You will never be freer. You will never have more joy and more peace than when you are living a holy life. Holiness is what sets you free from the destruction of sin. And that is God's desire for you. He wants holiness for you because that's what's best for you. That's where you find abundant life. And anything else is serving sin and serving yourself, and you are so miserable. I want to tell you something. The very moment that your thoughts begin to go down the track of what I want, what I deserve, what I need, what will make me happy, the very second your mind starts to go there, that's poison to your soul. And it will make you miserable and unhappy and discontent. And you will always be striving and straining, trying to get more, but never getting enough. And even that which you get doesn't really satisfy like you thought it would. So get your eyes off of yourself. Get your eyes back on being a slave to Jesus Christ and find the freedom that's there when you are his slave. The requirement, look at verse 12, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts in what? Blameless in holiness. It's completely impossible for everybody in this room but it is possible as we surrender to him. Look who does the work, verse 13, so that he may what? He may establish your hearts. He's the one that makes us holy. It's his work. Our job is to surrender. It's his job to do the work and to separate us to himself and to cleanse our hearts of the sin so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the what? At the coming. I got to tell you, nothing less than holiness is acceptable to him at his coming. We have to be holy. And yes, that, uh, you know, a lot of things play into that. And thank God we're not the judge that has to sort it all out. He sorts it all out. But you know, uh, there's a lot of things that do play into that. He, he take, he's a very merciful God. But the standard does not change. The standard is holiness at his coming. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. So who does the purifying? Who does the work? The God of peace. It's nothing. You can't manufacture holiness. You can't generate it. You can't be good enough. You can't modify your behavior enough. It's got to be God that does the work. And he will. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body, he didn't leave anything out, did he? And it's not a thing of, well, you know, in my spirit, I'm right with God and I'm clean with God, but my body, you know, just does these things that I can't control and, oh, well, God will forgive me. No, what does he say? May your whole spirit, soul, and body. 
Give us clean hands. Be kept blameless at what? At the coming. And again, like last week, I mean, it, it gets really redundant after a while because scripture after scripture after scripture sets the bar at holiness. We must be holy, separate unto him. He who calls you is faithful, and he will what? He will surely do it. He does the work, so it comes as we surrender to him. Jesus' strategy to be ready. Are you ready for this? These are the answers to the test in advance. In Matthew 24, he starts off and he says, look, I want you to know something. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be famines. There's going to be strange atmospheric and weather events that take place. Sounds like the earth we're living in, doesn't it? He says, and all of these things are going to come on the earth. And then he continues on down through chapter 24 like we were just, talk, like we were just reading where it says, look, you've got to be ready. You've got to make preparation. And then he rolls into chapter 25 and he gives us these three parables which tell us how to be ready. So are you ready for this? The parable of the virgins, the parable of the talents, and the parable of the final judgment. Let's see what he has to say. Number one, he's going to talk about the parable of the virgins. And the lesson from this parable is really there's got to be zero tolerance for procrastination. Tomorrow is too late. You've got to start preparing today. Choose this day. You know what happened? You know what the problem is with putting it off until tomorrow? The problem is tomorrow you'll put it off again till tomorrow. And it will never get done. Today has got to be the day that you choose. Why would you want to play Russian roulette with your eternity? You know, you've heard it said, I've heard it said from people, uh, I'm going to have fun and enjoy myself, and you know, maybe when I'm 70 or 75, maybe then I'll accept the Lord and make a change. You have no guarantees. You have no guarantees of this afternoon or evening. There's got to be zero tolerance for procrastination. I want to be ready and right with the Lord today, right now, this very hour, because this very hour he could come back. And any other approach to this, you're just playing... Russian roulette with your eternity, and is it really worth it? To have things your way means sin and death and destruction and emptiness and discontentment and lack of peace, bondage, addiction. To do it God's way means holiness and life and joy beyond description. Why would you want to tolerate procrastination? And that's really the message of the ten virgins here. As we get into this and read through this, let me uh, give you a clue here. Keep it simple. We really miss the meaning of this parable, and this parable in particular, because people want to get in and just really microanalyze, you know, well, what does the oil mean, and what does the lamp mean, and what does it mean when they did this, and, and, uh, and understanding the historical background of how marriage uh, celebrations took place is very helpful and can help, but don't don't miss the meaning. Jesus wanted to keep it simple, and the, the meaning is simple. So don't miss it by making it overly complicated. So let's read through and see what Jesus said. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. Lesson number one. Nobody else can get you ready but you. And you're not going to be able to draw off of someone else's preparation. This is something that only you can do for yourself. This is between you and God. So don't think you're going to live vicariously through someone else 
and, and, you know, and, and slip in on the tails of someone else who has prepared because it won't happen. And that's the point that he's trying to make here. You have to be ready for yourself. You have to get the oral for yourself. You have to have a relationship with God for yourself. Your spouse can't do it. Your children can't do it. Your parents can't do it. Your friends can't do it. Your church can't do it. Certainly your pastor can't do it. You better have the oil on your own for yourself. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, open to us. Just like they knocked on the ark, and the door of the ark was closed, and it's too late. And now there is no second chance. This is a test that we've got to get right the first time. Do you understand that? Do I understand that? There's no second chances. We've got to get it right the first time. Verse 12, but he answered, truly I say to you, I do not know you. Do you remember when we talked about this last week? Because in that parable in Matthew 7, when he said, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, you know, we've cast out devils. We've done many mighty works. We've done these miracles. Lord, won't you let us in? And what did he say? Depart from me, you, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And remember last week, just to review quickly, we said this was not a statement of omniscience. Because in God's omniscience, he knows you. He knows every fiber, every cell, every thought, every attitude. He knows every word that comes off your lips before you say it. He knows everything about you, more than you know about yourself, far more. So it's not omniscience that Jesus is talking about here. But does anybody remember from last week, what, what are we talking about here? It's not omniscience, but he's talking about relationship. And he's saying, I don't know you because you never let me in. Behold, I stand at the door and he's knocking. You know, we always think that's a, that's a verse for the unsaved. You know, that's a, a call to salvation for the unbeliever. He's saying that to the church there in Revelation. And there's a lot of people in church that won't let him in. There's a lot of people in church that won't surrender their self-righteousness and their self-will so that he can come in and do the work in your heart that he wants to do. Jesus will make you ready. Getting you ready is not the problem. You letting him in to do the work is the problem. And it's the pride, it's the self-righteousness, it's the stubbornness. He says, I don't know you. You never let me in. You never let me into your heart to where I could cleanse you and make you ready. Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. So being ready for the Lord's return is not in what you do. Because remember in Matthew 7, they came and they said, haven't we done these great works, Lord? Won't you let us in on the merit of what we've done? And he said, no. You're not getting in based upon the merit of what you've done. You're getting in by relationship, if you have let me in to do the work in your heart that only I can do. That's what gets you in. So when he says watch, therefore, that watching is a watching of I know he's coming, I'm expecting him to come, I'm not going to be lulled to sleep by this age and kind of forget about it or put it on the back burner, I'm going to keep this ever before me, Jesus is coming back, it could be today, and Lord, I'm surrendering my heart, please make me ready. Please make me holy so that I can be accepted by you when you do come. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away. If you're not paying closer attention, you're drifting away. How shall we escape if we do what? If we neglect such a great salvation. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, and I've got to speed it up here. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all those who have what? Loved his appearing. Do you love his appearing? 
Or like Chip Ingram said last week, are there still a few things you'd like to do and experience before his appearing? Do you love his appearing? Do you look for his appearing? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin like he did the first time by going to the cross, but to save those who are what? Eagerly waiting for him. Are you eager for his coming? Do you long for his coming? Do you long to see him face to face instead of seeing him through a glass darkly? Do you long for that change to take place when incorruption will, will, will replace corruption? And we will be like him and forever with him. That's our goal. That's what we long for. Our goal in life is, is not to build a bigger church. Our goal in life is not to finally get that promotion or to finally have our retirement in place. Or to, those aren't our, our goals is to see him. Our goal is for him to come back and receive us to himself. That's what we eagerly wait for. That's what we live for. That's the passion of our heart. Anything dealing with this earth life is secondary. It's the way it's got to be. 1 Thessalonians, we're out of time. I won't go through this. Let's get to the second thing. So Jesus talks about the parable of the virgins. What's the lesson of the parable? There are no second chances. You've got to be ready when he comes. You can't scramble at the last minute trying to get ready. If you're not ready when he comes, you're left behind. Then he goes into the parable of the talents. Let's read through it. Verse 14, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them. Don't you like that? Did you see that phrase? He went, how? At once. Now is the time to prepare, not tomorrow. And he traded with them, and he made another five talents. Now, you know, this is pretty good. How many of you have, you know, you're, you're, have a savings account, and that savings account is giving you, you know, an interest rate of like point zero 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 one two. Anybody, you know, interest rates are bad right now, right? I mean, if you found a savings account that would give you a 100% return on your money, wouldn't that be great? Now see, in, in our culture and in our economic environment, we can't imagine anything getting a 100% return on your money. But you know God expects that of you? <laughs> Pretty tall order. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug into the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with him. That's called the rapture. That's called the judgment seat of Christ. When the master comes back and he's going to settle his account with you, what shape is your account in? You know, when, when we get behind on some bills and we have to make some calls to banks or to... Uh, companies and say, hey, can you give me a little grace? I've run into some trouble, and can you give me an extension, or can we work this out somehow? You know, you're always a little nervous on that call because you're falling short, and sometimes it's because of things outside of our control. I'm not speaking critically. I'm just saying you all know the apprehension that's in your heart. There's a day coming when Jesus will settle his account with you. What shape is your account in? There can be legitimate excuses why you fall behind financially, but there's no excuse for falling behind spiritually. Jesus will come and settle his account with you. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. Jesus is expecting a 100% return from what he's invested into your life. The very blood of Jesus that he shed for you, that he invested into your life, is he getting 100% return from you out of that? The Bible that he gave you to read and to meditate and to pray over, 
the Bible, the, the word of God that he invested into your heart, is he getting 100% out of you for that? What about prayer? The great vehicle, the great relationship of prayer. Is Jesus getting 100% out of you in prayer? Or are you squandering his investment into your life? Can you get any more clearer than this? The one with the five talents came back with five more, 100% return. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. There are the rewards again that we will be judged by. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you've delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more, 100% return. His master said, well done, good and faithful servant. I think we get the point from this. The one who came who hit the one talent in the ground so that he wouldn't lose it. And he gives it back to Jesus. Now, if, you know, if you loan a friend something, like a tool or a drill or something, aren't you glad when you get it back? You know, friends that don't return borrowed items, they, they probably won't be friends for much longer, right? You, you like it when you get it back, right? Shouldn't Jesus just be happy he got it back? But he's not. He expects a 100% return on his investment. And this servant is called wicked and slothful. And he's cast, the worthless servant is cast into outer darkness. You don't want that to be the epitaph of your eternity. You want to be a wise and faithful servant. Let's return 100% to him. Second Peter says it so well. Chapter 1, verse 3, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So what has God invested in you? God has invested in you the power of God. God has invested into you and me all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now what is he going to get as his return? Well, it says here, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with what? Virtue. Virtue means goodness or righteousness. It means that the faith you have in God should create in you goodness. You do good things. You do what is right. You do things according to what's right with God. Add to your faith virtue. Add to your virtue knowledge, gnosis, the experiential knowledge. He's not talking about head knowledge or book learning here. He's talking about knowing God more and more. To this knowledge of God, you should add what? Self-control, temperance, the ability to say no to the passions of sin. To self-control, you should add steadfastness or patience to where you can endure through the trial. You don't give up. To this patience or steadfastness, you should add what? Godliness. To godliness, you should add brotherly affection where you truly love and care for one another. To brotherly affection, you, shall, uh, you should add what? Love. Now, the thing of it is, neither you nor I can produce virtue in our own life. Neither you nor I can produce self-control. We can't produce the steadfastness. We can't produce the godliness. But you know what we can do? We can read our Bibles. And we can let his word change our heart. We can't produce these qualities, but we can pray more. And we can have the Holy Spirit change our heart in prayer. And we, not, we may not be able to produce this brotherly affection and love for one another, but you know what we can do? We can come to church and be faithful and committed in our attendance. And as we do what we can do, God will do the work of producing these qualities in our heart. So let me ask the question again. Is God getting back 100% of what he's put into you? He does the work. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. There will be no excuse on that day. Last. Number three is your life spent in service to others. 25 verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then will he sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people 
one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was stranger, I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? Isn't it an interesting thing here? They didn't realize what they had been doing. And you know why people don't realize what they have been doing? It's because it's just so natural to them. This wasn't some ob obligatory command or legislation that they had to keep these rules and it just, that's what their heart was. It just came out of their heart so naturally. And in fact, it was just so natural in their heart to want to do these things that they didn't even have to think about it. So much so when Jesus mentions it, they think, M who, me? <laughs> I did what? See, it, it wasn't a chore to them. It wasn't a job to them. It was a joy to them. And the reaction is one of, Jesus, why, why are you thanking me? I should be thanking you for giving me the privilege and the pleasure of being able to serve other people and give to other people. I want to tell you something. The moment you start to center in on yourself, you're dying and you will be miserable. And that just spirals downhill into all kinds of bondage and addiction, trying to please yourself and nothing ever pleases yourself. The only way to life is when you begin to give it away in service to others. When did we see you sick or in prison or visit you? And the king will answer them and say, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And here he addresses the heart. When you did it to who? The least. How many of you like to do favors for millionaires? Because maybe they'll give you a big tip, right? Or maybe they'll uh, give you a real nice gift at Christmas or something, you know? Human nature just, you know, it, human nature loves to give to get. You know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. I'll do this for you if you do it for me, right? When you do it for the least of these, my brethren, you do it expecting nothing in return. There's going to be no gain that is returned to you you do it because that's who you are, not for what you can get. That's what he's saying here, is that's your heart. When you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to who? You did it to me. So we're, we're out of time, but let's review Matthew 25 in a thumbnail sketch. Jesus gives us the answer to the test before the test. And he says there's three things that we need to do to make sure that we're ready when he returns. Number one, we need to prepare today, this hour. Tomorrow, it's too late. Remember the parable of the virgins. When he comes, you won't have time to do the last minute scramble to try to get things together. If you're not ready when he comes, you'll be left behind. Secondly, the parable of the talents. He has given you all things that pertain unto life and godliness. He has invested into you the very body and blood of Jesus Christ. What return is he getting from you on his invest investment? Is he getting 100% return from you? Are you giving yourself 100% in prayer, in Bible study, in serving others, in being faithful to church? in encouraging other believers? Is he getting 100% back from you? Is your whole life for him? And then thirdly, are you living your life in service to others? Because that truly is the mark of the heart of God. The heart of God is never to live for yourself. The heart of God is to live for others. And that's the only way to be prepared in holiness for his return. Hopefully you can begin to see here uh, and as, as I know you do, holiness is not obeying a certain set of rules. 
And holiness is not acting in a certain pious way. Holiness is being separated unto God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind. You don't know anything different but to live your life for God. That's holiness. Father, we thank you for what you've shared with us from your word. And we thank you that holiness is the standard and holiness can actually be obtained. You make it possible. You, you've given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. We can't do it on our own. In fact, every time we try, we miserably fail. But the secret is knowing you and surrendering to you and letting you do the work. It's letting you in, Jesus. So, Father, right now, we purpose in our hearts to let you in. And to come to you honestly, to pour our hearts out to you. To confess to you our sins and our motives and our attitudes and what we're thinking and what we're going through and our struggles and our anger and our bitterness. And we'll just get it all out in the light, Father, because we know you can sort it out. And not only will you sort it out, but you will cleanse and heal and restore. And those things that cause us not to be ready for you, you will eliminate from our hearts. And you will create in us that clean heart that's ready to see you on that day. Father, we love you. And you've given us a standard to live by that you want to fulfill in us. So Father, help us. Give us the grace to surrender to you. And cause us to be ready on that day to hear that shout, to ascend into the sky, to be with you forever and ever. And that's our longing, that's our hope, that's what we're waiting for. So we say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.